February 15th, 2023 edition of the Urban League's Jobs Network Digital Career Success Series brought to you by the National Urban League. I'm your host, Kenneth L. Johnson, president of the Harlem, New York-based diversity recruitment firm, East Coast Executives. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. The National Urban League Digital Career Success Series, DCSS, is a professional development series that helps members of our Urban League Young Professional Chapters and other diverse job seekers explore the intersectionality of Blackness and professionalism while developing new skill sets that will enhance their careers. Through digital platforms such as webinars, LinkedIn, and Facebook Live, the DCS provides an opportunity for remote professional development right from one's computer. I'm really excited for today's session, powerful, powerfully navigating your future with a skills first mindset. Black Heritage Month is a time for us to build upon lessons of the past and create our future. This fireside chat with Rosanna will be grounded in LinkedIn's latest research on black professionals, current trends in our environment and career management strategies to help us navigate. We will dive into industry trends such as the shift towards the skills first labor market, cultivating transferable skills and the value of leaning into your authenticity we will also discuss how we can all support the advancement of Black leadership. I'm so excited. The objectives for this event, discussing trends impacting Black professionals on LinkedIn. We'll also suggest how Black professionals can leverage the platform to lean into the future. And we'll identify ways that Black leaders support employees during this time. Now, we've got a little different format this week, so I'm excited to bring on Jacqueline to lead this fireside chat conversation. We got the LinkedIn pros in the building, so I'm gonna to step to the side and let them do what they do. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's so glad, I'm thrilled to be back here um, with the National Urban League. Um, you know, always a pleasure to be here, but I'm actually really honored that we were you know, brought on uh, for Black History Month. And also, this is one of the most popular sessions, that's what you're saying, for, for the DCSC um, seminar series. So very excited. Um, this is a time that, you know, as you say, we want to reflect on the past, but really learn from those lessons and build for the future. And this is a great time for us, especially right before the career fair, right, to get really excited, to really powerfully take on some of the tools that are not only provided by, by LinkedIn, but also you know, to really hear um, from you know, Rosanna and in this discussion around some of the insights that you could powerfully take into the career fair to prepare yourself for the future and beyond. So with that, um, wanted to welcome Rosanna to Dorothy to the call, uh, to this wonderful webinar. Um, as we think about you know, reflecting on our, on our past, uh, during this month um, of reflection, but looking forward, right? So right now, Rosanna, as you know, um, there's just so much going on post pandemic as we, you know, as we're coming out of it and lo looking to the future. And there've been so many changes, right? So there's been talk of a recession, there's been layoffs, you know, but, you know, you look at, on the other hand, the unemployment rate is still relatively low, suggesting there's some opportunity. And we see some new trends emerging, such as a skills first mindset, where um, we see employers moving away from uh, viewing people mainly through degrees and pedigree, but really looking at what skills they have and also um, how they can how they can you know use their transferable skills as they leave you know careers at as they've evolved. So there's lots of opportunity there. There's lots of uncertainty, right? Um, which we acknowledge, but there's also great things that we can create for the future, right? Jacqueline, you're absolutely right. You know, so first I wanna thank the National Urban League for the DCSS. I mean, such a wonderful way to support our community and to create access to economic opportunity, which is what you and I wake up to every day. And, you know, and as far as what you shared, there's a lot to unpack there. It's a little bit of the best of times, the worst of times. But I think in particular for our Black community, as we talk about how we navigate this moment, 
the times are probably better. At least we feel more optimistic than we ever have before. Um, unemployment rate um, is lowest in the United States than it has been in far, far over 60 years. Um, just looking back to the early 70s, um, Black unemployment rate is the lowest it's ever been, and perhaps the lowest that we've seen it in the last 70 years, not just the last 50 years, um, as we're roughly at 5.3% unemployment in the United States, which, you know, there's still more to go, but it's also a really important indicator of the resilience of our community. You know, what we've seen during this time of economic uncertainty is that, you know, BIPOC workers, Black workers in particular, are pretty optimistic about what's going on. They haven't let this post-COVID period make a determination about their future. What we've seen is that overall, there's a great deal of optimism about careers. There's an understanding that having a network is critical to having access um, to your career. And where we see that, you know, roughly 40% of people on LinkedIn don't feel prepared for a recession, um, roughly 55% of the Black community feels that they have the network they need to navigate the future. And exercising discretion over building skills, you said something that I think is really instrumental to opportunity and access, that the workforce is changing and employers are changing what they seek. And it's no longer about the pedigree alone, because there's just not enough skill to meet the demands for all of the opportunities that do exist in the workforce. It really is about having the right skills. And how do you get those skills? How do you learn those skills and put them into practice, which is a really good reason why LinkedIn exists. We help people at gain that access to economic opportunity, not just through the people they know, but by having a vehicle from which they can engage in conversations to understand what skills are needed for the jobs they want and be able to use a LinkedIn learning to build the skills they need and to learn those skills to apply them for new opportunities. And I think, you know, what my own career has taught me is that skills change. What companies need changes. You know, what was in demand 10 years ago is not as likely to be in demand today. And so even as we are in the workforce, whatever we're doing, we have to keep learning and we have to keep developing new capabilities that help us not only navigate the work environment, but maintain our relevance where we're working and maintain the criticality of skill for the opportunity when it emerges, whether that opportunity is with our existing employer or with a new employer, effectively what got us here won't get us there. So we have to keep learning and developing. And that means we have an opportunity to get ahead. We have an opportunity to disrupt the flow. We've also seen from some of the data that we've pulled that more than 45% of Blacks have you know, started their own businesses during this time. And a really important signal to that entrepreneurship is how we're utilizing our own internal work experiences and companies to fuel what we need to understand about running our own business. That entrepreneurship is vital for a variety of reasons. We've seen people leave their jobs during the, the great reshuffle or the great resignation, as some have termed, termed it, in part because they weren't making enough money or because they didn't have enough flexibility in being able to work remotely and to address the needs of caregiving as the demands of caregiving grew during the pandemic. Uh, so we've seen a lot of things in a very short period of time over the last three years um, in the aftermath of the tremendous unrest um, with George Floyd's murder that has really led us to revisit, you know, where we work, why we work, how we work. The pandemic sent us all home. And for companies that told us we couldn't work remotely, suddenly everyone was working remotely. And that's forged a whole new way of operating as, you know, for many of us, we didn't have to think about what it would be like to be in an environment where we didn't feel as though we belonged effectively. But how do we create the connections and do the work and be in a space that's comfortable for us um, and be able to focus on the work and not on the 
distractions and the microaggressions that come up in the workplace. So, you know, with every challenge, there can be a silver lining. I think the silver lining that we're left with is as we do return to work, and as we are seeing more employers request um, and open jobs for people to be in the workplace and not working remotely, I don't think we'll ever, ever get back to the point where all jobs are in the office all the time. Yes. And I think we've developed a, a level of agency that says, you know, I want to work in an environment where I can authentically be myself, where I can be comfortable in my own skin. And I don't have to wear this suit and show up as someone else in order to be hired or show up as someone else in order to get ahead. It's really important that we feel not only that we can be ourselves, but that we are supported and that we can be in environments that enable us to thrive because of all the contributions we make. I love that. So, you know, um, you summed up all the the key trends that have been happening as a result of the pandemic, right? So more authenticity, more uh, flexibility, more, um, you know, ability for us to, you know, work wherever, but also become more productive in, in that whole thing, especially for, for people of color. Let's, let's go more into the trends that are the impact, you know, as we, we speak about what's happened, the global, some of the global trends that we've spoken to. Um, let's get into more of, of how has that expected Black professionals in the, in the um, platform? Like what, you know, are, I think, what are some of the trends there? So, you know, a couple of things that I think are, are worth noting. It's important to have strong networks to be able to accomplish what we want in life. So one of the trends that we've noticed is this, you know, leaning into networks. Now, you know, when I began my career, networking was a different thing. You know, networking was a place you went to to meet people, fortunately, on LinkedIn, you can meet people who are up to things that you really admire and respect, and you can learn from them, and never have to leave the comfort of your laptop or your mobile phone. Um, and, you know, and yet what we see is that while 55% of Black professionals say they have the network community and resources to find, for example, a new position if they get laid off, it means 45% of folks still aren't feeling comfortable that their network is sufficient to find that next play, as we term it at LinkedIn, that next opportunity um, to find greater economic providence, to get a higher paying job or to do something that really motivates and excites. You know, the other thing that we are seeing is there's a large increase, 27% increase in the number of Black women who are applying for remote jobs. Now, that's a really telling story. You know, when we think about caregiving in today's environment, it likely means we have responsibility not only for children that we're raising, but just as much so may have responsibility for caregiving for a parent or an elder in our family or someone who has unique needs. Um, and for many of us, it may be both. And so having flexibility has become really critical for retaining the workforce that employers have. And if you're in a role that doesn't allow for that, it's more likely among our Black community that we're seeking those kinds of opportunities today. And, you know, that kind of increase in pursuing those opportunities is a very telling story about companies that want to hire not only Black talent, but companies that want to keep talent that's that's successful. You know, the other thing that I touched on earlier is just this increase in entrepreneurship and even entrepreneurship in the work environment. So, you know, two to three times the number of Black, of white people are pursuing these external side hustles, so to speak. For the Black community, it's not only how we're making more money, it's how we're building wealth for the future. It's how we're making determinations about how we're preparing for our exits so that we're not just stepping out, you know, on faith, really important, but we're stepping into opportunities that we're creating ourselves. And that's really important. What's also really important and very telling is that story that, you know, 48% of people who start their own businesses in the Black community are saying that it's because they're not making enough money in their jobs. There's a real question of pay equity that companies still need to think about. 46% are citing flexibility as the reason why they need to, to create their own, their own gig. 
And then 30% say they're doing it because they're just not feeling fulfilled at work. They either don't feel they belong or they don't feel that they're getting an opportunity to develop and grow. And when you think about nearly one third of your, your Black workforce not being engaged, that leaves a lot of opportunity for companies to think differently about how they're investing in their employees, how they're developing their employees, how they're connecting employees to internal opportunities. And going back to the skills first mindset, what are we doing to identify the skills that are needed for roles and helping our employees who are in place build those skills while they're doing their current jobs? Real opportunity to prepare for the future by seeing the future in our existing workforce, which is incredibly talented. And so there's a real call for companies to think about how they're in the present and looking to the future, preparing for the future, and how each of us can prepare ourselves for the opportunity that the future can offer. I just hear that's wonderful. I just hear such an opportunity to be more intentional on behalf of companies. So as a leader, if you're listening as a leader, really paying attention to uh, making sure that you have a clear grasp in terms of what skills are needed for the jobs you need um, to grow within your company, but also providing uh, proactively providing uh, career paths and thinking, helping your employees think through the future in terms of what skills they need. Um, so that's that's tremendous, you know, because you're actually speaking to what we can do as leaders within our own community to make sure that, you know, folks around us are doing well and prospering in our community and really look and spread that message and implore everyone that's listening to really use LinkedIn to, um, to showcase your skills and to really lean into this future that you're hearing about, right? So really. no jobs, uh, emphasis on skills, emphasis on flexibility, um, you know, really leaning into the change. So with that, I think it's a good segue into for those job seekers out there, right? Um, whether that be people who are looking to develop themselves within the current role, right? You don't you don't have to be moving from place to place. You can actually develop your your career by moving laterally right? Within an environment you are, or if you are looking for a job, what are some of the things that you can do right now to really prepare yourself and not, you know, again, not just sit back and say stuff is happening to me, but actually take, can, can, you know, some control of your future. What would be some of the things you would advise folks to do? Yeah, this conversation feels so, so important and so timely to me and so timeless as well. Um, my very first job was with the National Urban League as a as a high school intern. Right. And it was an amazing experience for me. It's where I began building skills. It was where I began building a professional network. And I was able to see people who looked like me. And we're going back a lot of years now. Um, and I say that because it really it, it really reminds me of something I learned. When I, when I began my first internship, I was only 15 years old, but there was a real sense of no one accomplishes success alone. And I think it's a really important message, even in this moment, to think about how are we building our support systems? Where are our allies? Who are the people who can help us not only understand what's going on, but stand up for us when things are going down, so to speak? And Allyship is such a critical element of the inclusion equation in any company that certainly for us as professionals, who are my allies? Who are the people who are speaking up for me when I'm not in the room? Who are the people who, you know, seek to understand so that my voice doesn't stand alone, but they work to amplify Black voices? They stand in the room and they note when Black voices aren't present in the conversation that's germane to our ability to contribute in in an environment. So all of us should think about who are the allies in our network and who are the allies at work that we can depend on, that we can seek out for support, for, for those basic needs of feeling as though we belong in this environment. So first, allyship. The second thing is, you know, as we think about you know, conversations we have with allies. 
you know, it's really important for allies to recognize that it's not a title you wear. It's a, it's an experience you earn. Like just because I showed up at a black history month event that was being held by an ERG at work, that doesn't automatically anoint me an ally. It really is the journey of the work that you're doing to not only understand the community, but to understand all of the systemic barriers the Black community has faced over time, Um, to understand that opportunity isn't just opportunity. In fact, there's no opportunity without access. And so when we think about how we find the next play or how we get um, promoted or how we are able to manage an internal career move, All of that really requires the support network of people who help us understand not just how the work gets done, but who are the players with influence and who are the people who are introducing me to those individuals and talking about me in a way that's uh, positive and affirming and, and lifts me up. And that's really important. So, you know, as we seek allies, it's really important to make sure that our allies are for real, not just people who are wearing the banner, as opposed to people who are doing the work. Um, the second thing, you know, is kind of basic, but LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network with more than 900 million members today. And when we think about how critical that is, when something goes down, first thing people do is turn to LinkedIn to find out the story behind who that person was, whether it's in the news or whether it's at work or whether it's a position you're applying for, whether it's someone that you're meeting for the first time at an event, LinkedIn is a primary source. So if you're on, if you're not on LinkedIn, you should be on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, what does your profile look like? Do you have a complete profile? Does it tell us not only the work you've done, but the skills you've built, where you've applied it, not just paid work, but volunteer work is valid and it counts as well. So utilizing social media to tell your story, not just to you know post an update, um, is really important because that's where people will often go to find talent, to learn more about what you have to give, and certainly to even see, do we have connections in common? So who are your connections and how are you actively building connections? On the LinkedIn platform, more than 9,000 connections are made every minute. Eight people are hired every minute. It can be you as well. So I really want all of the audience watching this who's going to be attending the career fair to know there are numerous ways that you can create value for yourself and you can make not only your skills um, available to others, but make that profile powerful and available in telling your story as well. And be one of those Black professionals who can feel confident that your your connections and your network are sufficient for what you're up to, that they're going to hold you up and help you identify that next opportunity. And that was something that I learned in my first internship at the National Urban League, the power of the network, to have people who can speak to not only how you go about doing the things you do, but to give you feedback on how you're doing, um, to introduce you to other people and build connections. And so, you know, it's really a privilege that something that I learned so long ago among a group of leaders that I so respect and value, um, I'm able to do many, many decades later and have this opportunity to, to share with all of you. I think um, what I'm hearing is an intentionality around building out your your not only your allies but also advisors, mentors, uh, access to to resources, but doing that on an ongoing basis, which I think LinkedIn provides you with the opportunity to do that. And then um, love the point around the skills, right? Another. Uh, stat which really opened my eyes was like 44% of all hires check your skills on LinkedIn or search for your skills, right? As they do undergo a job search. Yeah. And that 44% is actually hiring explicitly based on skills. Exactly. So that's a huge, um, you know, if you think that that small part of your profile is, or that part of your profile is not that 
important, especially now with all the changes in jobs and all of the um, the thinking about your transferable skills. Uh, that's the way that people are reporting it to other uh, careers. So very, very, very important that you actually take the time and, and think that through yeah. and update that on a regular basis. Yeah, there's a real miss. There are a lot of people who just put down their employers. They don't describe what they're doing. They don't list the skills and they don't have recommendations. So it's very hard to see what this person can be relied on upon for, what they're bringing to the game. There's also the flip side of it. You know, learning skills need not be as difficult or as onerous. You know, on LinkedIn, there are more than 20,000 courses across business, wow. creative, and technical categories, which effectively means an individual with access to LinkedIn learning can go home and learn in three to five minute increments modules and build skills on a daily basis. So to your point, it's not, I'm going to put my profile up and you know just watch what goes on on the platform, but how do I engage and participate and have it create value for me? So connecting with people, learning from people who are, you know, they're sharing their pearls of wisdom every day on the platform, but taking it further, actively engaging in learning because the skills you're building for yourself are going to pay off for you tomorrow. And if you don't have those skills, the opportunity will be missed because someone else with the skill will get hired. I think the other thing that becomes really important is if you are someone who's looking for a job on LinkedIn, utilizing the tools on the platform, the open to work profile is a great way to not only signal to employers that you're actively looking and it increases the likelihood of getting a recruiter message, you know, by double. So who doesn't want to have double the chance of being reached out to by a recruiter? Um, An individual with an open to work message on average is 40% more likely to receive in mails, not only from recruiters, but also 20% more likely to receive messages from their LinkedIn community. People who want to support you and would now have a way of knowing that you're seeking their help. So really important to think about, you know, Some people are concerned because they feel they put open to work and it in some way signals that there's something wrong. More than 18 million people on LinkedIn have open to work. And what the data tells us is it's really an instrumental way to get noticed, to have people know that you're looking and you're ready for an opportunity. And if they reach out to you, you're going to reach back. And that's where new connections get made. That's where that connection to economic opportunity can be realized. So all this is out there, you know, and it reminds me of a a phrase that uh, someone said to me, which, you know, closed mouths don't get fed, right? (laughs) And, and this is, this is a, this is a great way to literally raise your hand and say, hey, this is something I'm interested in. And um, the studies have shown that people do benefit and find jobs as a result of of flagging that they're open to work. So all these tools are here. I I hope that everyone realizes that all these tools are here to help and support as you go through whatever career transitions you're going through, whether it be looking for a new job or wanting to change careers. Uh, LinkedIn Learning is great for that in terms of uh, you know, even if it's setting aside a few minutes a day to start new courses or, you know, blocking off significant amounts of time, all this tactical blocking stuff is already there that you can just jump on right away that can add add to your network, strengthen your network, and also increase those possibilities. Um, another point I wanted to say as well, Rosanna, as you were speaking, I I realized that some of the strongest networks have been formed within the Black community offline, right? We have very strong uh, institutions, churches, communities. Um, You're always one person removed from anyone. (laughs) It's an amazing coincidence how how we're so tight-knit as a community sometimes. Absolutely. And we already do this naturally, and it's all about taking it online and building that um, that community online. 
uh, with each other and lifting each other up and learning from each other and actually tapping new people that we we uh, may want to be like. We could, you know, follow them, you know, follow what they're sharing. So we already do this naturally. It's just a matter of of um, taking it to another medium. Really, really great to to say this is not new. In fact, what it what we are talking about is taking a skill set and applying it in a way that better prepares us and leans into our own resilience. You know, lots of research has been done. People with more diverse networks are they sit at the intersection of opportunity as well. And it's really just a function of you're more likely to find your next job, not from someone who knows you well, but from someone who barely knows you, who happens to either know that you're looking or has heard that you're looking, or even more so that you find an opportunity in a company or organization where you have a connection. And we see that people are more likely to get hired in places where they do have a connection as well. So there is a constant set of trade-offs in this creation and expansion of networks to help us get to where we're going. And it's never to say that our networks aren't good. Our networks are what they are. Question is, is your network going to be sufficient for what's next for you? Do you know people in that industry? You know, a lot of people are coming into the work of um, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and belonging, as we term it. And I get reach reach outs all the time on the platform from people who want exploratory conversations about how my career lent it, lent itself to this role that I'm in and how did I get into this career. And the reality is those conversations are really important for not only how we share our story, but to be able to identify and understand where there are connections that we should be making to our personal story and not just the work story or education story that we already have. Really important to have these abilities to explore with someone to get sometimes a real life view of what an opportunity in a space, whether it's in divs or software engineering or in sales, really looks like. Um, You know, I grew up in an environment where it was presumed I would be a professional, but likely a doctor or a lawyer. No one in my family ever worked in a corporate environment. So I'm I'm the first in my family to work in the corporate environment and still one of the few in my family to work in a corporate environment. There are very few people in, in my family who typically have pursued the corporate path. And so there is a real understanding that, you know, there wasn't anyone in my family who could mentor me in that way about the corporate career, much less what it takes to have an executive role or how you lead in an environment like this. And it's been the people in my network people I worked with, uh, former managers, mentors, um, people that I've met serendipitously along the way, and some people that I've never met in person, but I met on LinkedIn who were generous enough to share their thoughts and ideas. I'm one of those people who can say, I found my job on LinkedIn, or rather LinkedIn found me. And so I, I would want everyone who's hearing this to know that you too can be that person who either finds the role or is found by the role, found by the company to do an opportunity. But it's critical that we not think because I've done the job, because I have the skill, it's going to be that easy to be found. Like you really, it's important to invest in having a voice on the platform, having a voice in your community, having a voice that tells the story of what it is that you want to do so that others aren't defining you. And I think that's really important under any circumstance, whether it's the circumstance of finding a job, whether it's the circumstance of, you know, maybe you got caught in a layoff. We're seeing a lot of people impacted by um, the moment that we're in and workforce reductions are making it a little more challenging. And sometimes our confidence is shaken. Um, Sometimes we feel as though it's going to take more because we have to explain why were we the ones who were caught up in the layoff. And the reality is life happens. It happens to us every day. And we shouldn't allow our circumstances to define who we are, because in reality, our circumstances are our circumstances. None of us is our circumstances. You are never your circumstances. So I say that because it's really easy to feel we're off our game. You know, LeBron had an amazing game. You know, he's truly the goat in my book. 
Um, but setting the new record for the most points meant that he showed up every day for 20 years to shoot his shot, play his game. And yes, one of these days, it comes to pass that he becomes the greatest shooter of all time with the most points. We each have that in us. We can find that greatest greatness in us, but we have to show up every day. I love that. I love that example. I love that reminder. We're not our circumstances. We can define them. And um, I can't think of anything. I mean, I've been at LinkedIn for seven years. Um, very proud of the fact that I work at a place that literally you can define your future online and find your flock and find your uh, community that will lift you up. And that's how that's how I think about it. And I encourage everyone to keep thinking about LinkedIn that way as well. Um, so as we, you know, as we think about our way, you know, looking forward, right? Um, you know, we talked about the circumstances that we're in right now, the trends, how we can navigate those trends, what we can do as leaders to help our employees. We talked about uh, as as employees, how one can take charge of their career in some, in some really tactical ways on LinkedIn to, to keep ahead and, and to keep navigating the future. Um, one of the things that I, I, you know, not struggle with, but always ask myself is like, how can we continue to advance Black leadership? Like, how can our community, uh, especially as we think of this month, Black Heritage Month, yeah. Um, and look ahead. And we've heard all these things about community and support and mentorship and allyship. Um, how can we continue to do well and do good as we go out in the future? Yes, I think your question is one that speaks to what we've seen over the last couple of years. You know, after George Floyd's murder, we saw that companies were rallying around the Black community and making pledges. You know, LinkedIn made a commitment to double the number of Black and Latino um, senior uh, leaders by 2025. And for the Black community, we we reached that number last year, and we don't stop there. Um, the work continues. So first, you know, as leaders, it's really important to take a stand. You can't sit on the sidelines and expect things to change. Um, so leadership is active and it's engaged. And the trajectory of the Black professional is in many ways, but not exclusively tied to those who are leading in this moment, who are saying we're going to do something different in our environment to ensure that there's access to the opportunities we have. Um, the second thing is, as leaders, the world is changing. And so, you know, early in my career, this conversation for inclusion was often treated as though that's a nice to have, it's not something one needs to have. The diversity of the workforce today really makes it incumbent upon anyone who considers themselves a leader to have an inclusive skill set, to be able to operate with cultural humility, psychological safety, the curiosity to get to know about cultures and communities that they may not be a part of, to build a network that's inclusive of people who are different from ourselves, to be able to form meaningful connections because we know that relationships matter, um, to be hungry and curious to learn from others because no one has all of the answers and certainly no leader ever leads alone. So there's a lot of work that leaders need to engage in in order to be relevant in five years or 10 years. You know, we see certainly um, from Gen Z, there's an expectation they have when they come into the work environment. You know, some of these conversations they consider just foolishness, and they're not interested in working anywhere where companies are ill-equipped, unprepared to build an environment where they can feel comfortable and their friends can feel comfortable too. So, you know, there's a lot that we're hearing in the world of politics. There's a lot that we're seeing in the course discourse um, here in the United States today. It saddens me, but it also is one that I'm very pragmatic about. It's like people can believe all sorts of things. It doesn't make it true. 
And the reality is in order for any business to be productive, in order for any business to sell its products to a growing market, it has to have a connection to that growing market. In the United States, that growing market is black and brown. And so our skills, our experiences, our consumer purchasing dollars are immensely valuable for the survival of any company. And those companies that aren't willing to invest in this work and continue that investment because they may feel the market is changing and so there's another priority, they do so at their own peril. I think it's going to be really hard for them to win back a valuable consumer and a valuable employee if they make the misstep of not paying attention today. So as leaders, this is all of our responsibility. As leaders, it's critical that we understand that the workforce requires us to bring in talent that represents different communities. The Black community is a valuable, critically educated community that has been underemployed for far too long. Um, And I think our moment has come. I love that. I love that. And, um, you know, uh, well said, um, the world of, you know, DEI and moving forward, this movement is far from slowing down. It doesn't matter, you know, what's happening in the economy. Um, in fact, um, LinkedIn put out a jobs, uh, to the top jobs, 2023 jobs on the rise, alongside the most um, popular jobs or head of revenue operations, but right there was also DEI professionals as well. So um, everything that you said, Rosanna, around the increasing importance, the continued importance, the drive, uh, leaders have to pay attention to this area, but also it's a necessity moving forward. Absolutely. Um, With that said, thanks for joining us on this chat. I think we hit a lot of content during this uh, webinar. Um, We'll continue to drop important resources in the chat which, you know, help you with getting your profile together, but also job trends, hot, you know, what jobs are on the rise, um, ways you can link to growing opportunities on the site and practical things that can help. But I really encourage everyone to take some of the larger ideas uh, to heart and really put them into implementation. Don't be that 45% of, of the people that we surveyed who don't have the network to find that next job. Work on that today and to build your network so that you, uh, not only you're resilient, you continue to be, um, to powerfully take on your future as you move ahead. Thanks everyone. And I'll turn it back over to Kenneth. Amazing conversation. I really feel like I was a a fly on the wall today. Uh, Like how, how amazing is this? Rosanna, received her start as an intern at the National Urban League and returns as the Vice President of Global Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging at Leak Bend to support Urban Leaguers. Jacqueline Jones shows up again to lead an impactful conversation as Head of Strategic Partnerships, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging at LinkedIn to support Urban Leaguers. It's true, as the National Urban League Senior Vice President of HR, Wanda Jackson, often shares, once an Urban Leaguer, always an Urban Leaguer. I thank you both for joining us today. On behalf of the National Urban League, Wanda Jackson, Dory Brown, and the the entire UL Jobs Network team, and also today behind the scenes, the LinkedIn team, Jessica La, Xavier Cunningham. (laughs) My name is Kenneth L. Johnson. We thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the career fair and make sure to connect and follow up with everyone you meet on the LinkedIn platform. Thank you. We'll see you later today for another Digital Career Success Series exclusive for Black History Month.